So here's the thing. I don't know how contrarian it is, but I will say to you that this notion of shattering conventional wisdom, I'm going to shatter wisdom that you probably don't think is conventional. And I think that is, in fact, quite the point. So in the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about five things. I'm going to talk about disruption. I'm going to talk about demographics, experiences, purpose, and just some final thoughts that I want to share. So let's start with disruption. Let's just shatter it and talk about it. So here's the problem, right? This morning's disruption is this afternoon's conventional wisdom. Let's be very clear. And that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is that we start, we talk about disruption, 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 and before you know it, that just becomes sort of the boring, conventional thing that we do, and we can't get out of our own way. And I think that's a problem. So even if you go back two years and you start looking at some of the writing that's been done about this, we see the Guardian, the Silicon Valley buzzword disruption as the aftertaste of a sucked battery. Now, I don't know anybody here ever sucked a battery. I haven't, but it doesn't mean anything anymore, and so it goes. The one that I think, though, that is really important, and the one that I find, in fact, to be the most true, is products and services are designed to disrupt market sectors, that is, bringing to market things no one really needs, more than to solve actual problems. And that is what I believe is the single biggest issue, is I write about this all the time. We have the ability, because of technology, we have the ability, because of where we are in the world, and because, in truth, of things that we can disrupt, to change the world, and instead, we're worrying about how do we get pizza to someone's house quicker when, in fact, 100 years ago, they figured out how to get it there, not just quicker, but fresher and crisper as well. So we've got a problem. So I think it's time to, think, to rethink the way we look at disruption. The way I look at it, I say to myself, OK, are these companies actually disrupting me? What is actually being disrupted here? I use Uber every day. I think it's awesome. I also use taxis, I also use a driver. But I ask myself, is, do they disrupt my life? Au contraire. It's giving me tremendous opportunities. It's much easier for me. Warby Parker, I love Warby Parker, right? How many people here have Warby Parker glasses on? All right, not as many as I would have thought, but here's the deal, right? Go back and read their business plan. They were gonna disrupt the entire eyewear industry. Fact is, they've disrupted nothing. They're actually opening up stores. Now what they do is they have great designs, they're wonderful, I'm gonna talk about them a little bit, but they haven't disrupted the wearer. So not only have they not disrupted their category, they haven't disrupted the wearer either, and Amazon certainly doesn't disrupt the buyer. And by the way, I'm in that 75% category of buying on Amazon, and I've been buying there from day one. So let's take a look at some things that are related to disruption and talk about them and see where they go. So I don't know if you know about Dabawalas. If you don't, you should. They're important, particularly because they are now related to Flipkart, Walmart being interested in Flipkart, probably buying them. You should know about Dabawalas. But at the end of the day, what a Dabawala does in Mumbai, where people go to work very, very early in the morning because of the traffic, the food in the factories is pretty bad, and they like to have their own lunches. They like to have a hot lunch come from home. So there's a system of Dabawalas, guys who deliver their lunches on by bicycle. There is an algorithm at work here. The algorithm is done with little colored pieces of card, and somehow everybody gets their hot lunch delivered. It is unbelievable. It is incredible. You should read about it. But here's the thing, right? So when Flipkart decides that they have to have a better way to deliver, they don't start talking about drones. And they don't talk about Uber. They go to the Dabawalas, because they, in fact, are the best way to deliver in Mumbai. But here is disruption, if you will. What has happened with the Davos, they've been given e-bikes. So it's not like I went and looked to say, OK, I got to have drones to deliver. I went and I gave the best way to deliver an e-bike to make it even more efficient. So read about Davos. They're amazing. Here's another disruption. So we all know how much Amazon has disrupted the category. My belief is that they've disrupted nothing. They've evolved a category that was actually disrupted by Sears and Roebuck back in the 1800s. And what's fascinating is go and Google or Bing. I have to say Bing because Microsoft's a client, so I say it at least once a uh, presentation. But you can Google it. Um, this, is, 
This is from Sears 1890, from the Wish Book. And one, if anybody's interested later, I'll tell you about the Wish Book. Goods that can be delivered at your door anywhere in the U.S. for less than they can be procured from your local dealer. So here's Sears and Roebuck taking advantage of railroads, of big carts with horses that could be pulled. There weren't really any roads. Here's Amazon 2018 to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. This is the exact same company. Now, Sears fell down because they couldn't figure out how to take their quote-unquote disruption and make it work against the new technology. That was a problem. But the truth is, they were the people who figured out that, in fact, I don't, if I have a warehouse full of stuff and I can deliver it one-to-one, -one, that is a great deal because those people don't have to come to my store to buy. Amazing. Two more. Everlane and Warby Parker, two stores, two, <laughs> two stores, two companies that swore they would never open retail. They swore, go back and read their business plans. These people were never going to open retail. Warby Parker can't open them fast enough. Everlane. We said we'd never have a physical store, but we found out from doing pop-ups that allowing people to touch our fabrics makes a difference in the likelihood of buying. Duh. Like, I'd be embarrassed to say something like that. Isn't that clear? Isn't that clear? It doesn't take away from technology. Folks, understand, if you're going to tweet this, don't say David is telling you that the web is going to tell Crap, I buy everything online almost, except for things that I like to buy in a store. By the way, so do millennials. Let's be clear. But this is amazing to me. So this, these people come and they say, we're never going to have a store. And yet, with people like that experience. What's wrong with it? It's OK. We can have both. That is the problem we have. Warby Parker is the same. Presentation by retail experts of either online or offline is a false choice. It really is the intersection of the two. And that's the point. We live in a world where we have now come to this place where technology is. To talk about digital first is ridiculous. We live in a digital world. I'm going to talk about that at the end. Get over it. Technology is here. We use it. It's not one or the other. So here's the example, right? Jeff Bezos says drones. And you can go online and you can see the famous um, experiment they did delivering something in Birmingham, across Birmingham, England, across the field. And the guy came out of his house and picked it up and it was really great. But here's the thing. Jeff says drones. Procter & Gamble, Unilever, everybody else starts their drone program because it's really important, as Jeff said so. Meanwhile, he opens up Amazon Books, buys Whole Foods, and runs the Washington Post. Hello? Like, what's going on? Because he's smart. He gets it. He understands it. I'm going to talk about that in a second. How many people here have been to the Amazon store in Columbus Circle? All right, not enough. Everybody, when you leave here today, go to Columbus Circle, go to the Amazon store. It is an incredible experience because it's a store. And it's a really good store. And what's most interesting about it is that it's an actual store. It's a retail store. And it works on the best principles of retail, which, by the way, I believe is the way Amazon works. I think it's an incredible merchandise space, much better than anybody else online. And what's interesting in this store is you've all been to the Apple store, and you know one of the great things about the Apple store is you buy something, and you have an associate standing there who used to be a square, but now they just can check you out on their iPads. And it's pretty cool, and you think that's great. So when you go into the Amazon store, you expect that that's what they're going to do. They're going to check you out right away. You pick up a book, someone will come and check you out. Hell no, because they don't want you to buy one book. That's what will happen. Think about it. It's just good retail. If I could check out just by standing there with an associate, I'd buy one book and I'd walk out. Instead, I walk around the store. I pick up a second book. Somebody asks me, can they help me? Can they show me something new? Hey, have you seen this? When you walk the retail gauntlet, you know, the, the famous line like this that has all those little tchotchkes, high volume, high margin things, people are taking them and putting down. So by the time you walk out, you're walking out with three or four things. It's absolutely brilliant. So my view is that you have to understand Jeff Bezos. I'm obsessed with him. I'm obsessed with Amazon. Here's what he says. If we can keep our competitors focused on us while we stay focused on the customers, ultimately, will turn out all right. So Jeff says, drones, watch me. And he watches his customers. And he opens up stores because he can do that. Because why not? Why wouldn't you do that? It works, right? People like to feel the merchandise. It's good. 
Sometimes you just want to walk into a bookstore and browse, browse through a few books and take a look. That is good. Now, Jack Ma, on the other hand, says, if I were you, I'd focus on customers. I'd not focus on making money. I'd focus on making values. So I think what you have to do is think like Jeff Bezos. And so if you think like Bezos, think like Amazon. So this is Alibaba. Alibaba believes the future of new retail will be a harmonious integration of online and offline. So the notion of disruption is way different when you actually think about it. It's not like, OK, it's all disruptive. We're not going to buy in stores anymore. Au contraire, it's that I'm going to follow people, because people actually disrupt. But I don't want to disrupt their lives. I want to make their lives easier for them. So I'm just going to follow this line and do things that make it better for them. Now having said that, I ask you all to watch this space. Because I think this is fascinating. I'm watching it literally on a weekly basis. And here's why. If you ask most people what PRIME stands for, and I did it again this morning in a presentation, most people will in fact tell you that PRIME means you get it today, tomorrow, free. It's not what it means. Not at all. So this is the way the box looks today. Just take a look, right? So choose your PRIME delivery option. Sure, you can get it tomorrow for an extra eight bucks. I can get it free, quote unquote, in two days. It's not really free because I paid for that. That's prime. Or I can get it free, and I love this, a week later, no rush shipping, but I get a dollar reward. Now think about that, because he wants to push you to the dollar reward. If you don't really need it, why would you, maybe I'll take the dollar, but Amazon makes way more money. So, there's even the notion we don't even understand the business because we all have the wrong view of what they are. They are smart retailers, full stop. I don't think they're a tech company. They use technology brilliantly, but they are brilliant retailers. So here's a few things that others would call disruption. I call dissidence. Now, the reason I call it dissidence is because dissidence creates movements. Disruption creates confusion. Dissidence creates movements. A dissident is somebody who looks at what is and says, I'm going to do something different, something better, and I'm going to get people around me who agree. So I'm just going to show you a few Zappos. I love Zappos. Anybody buy shoes from Zappos here? Yeah, great. So you know that Zappos is totally contrarian to the entire world of catalogers, of online, where we don't want people calling our, our 800 numbers, our helplines. We don't, because it costs money. They want you to call. Now, the truth is they don't really want you to call, but they tell you you can call. So the more they tell you you call, probably the less you call, but the better you feel. Because you know that you can call. It's awesome. And the 800 number is on every single page of their website, of their mobile. It makes no difference. That 800 number is there, and it's, hey, call us. Don't worry about it. They're brilliant. CVS Pharmacy created an incredible dissident movement. They stopped selling cigarettes. It's amazing. Sales went down. After a few months, sales went back up, and now they're leading the category again. Amazing, but they created distance. They created a movement. They took a, they took a chance. Tasty. Everybody know Tasty, BuzzFeed's channel? So it's BuzzFeed's way of looking at cooking. It's their cooking channel. So it's really amazing. They did a cookbook. Tasty did a cookbook, and it's BuzzFeed did a cookbook. So when I first heard about it, I assumed that it was a BuzzFeed product. It was some kind of a list. It was online, whatever. Hell no. They did a book, a real book. They printed a book. It became a bestseller. And they added to that book the George Foreman Grill, now called the Tasty Grill from BuzzFeed, and it was a huge seller. Again, dissidents. They changed the market. Dicks. So the morning of the, of the um, announcement, I spent time with the CEO of Dicks. Unbelievable, right? So they're first people to go out there and say, we're not going to sell automatic weapons anymore. Now, they took a calculated risk, hurt their business a little bit in the, in the beginning. In the end, it's not going to make a difference. But they created a dissident movement because all of a sudden, the truth of the matter is that most of the people who are NRA supporters actually agree with them. And so it's not going to really make that big a difference to their business. In fact, it's going to go elsewhere. I think it's going to help them. And Facebook does what they call 2G Tuesdays which is that most of the world 
is not on 4G. You know, we're all, we live in New York, we live in Los Angeles, we live in Chicago. We're all jaded. We think that everybody is on huge bands of, of uh, connectivity. Most of the world is not. And so they do 2G Tuesdays. How do I deliver interesting things on the low band? How do I do that? I think it's amazing. So at the end of the day, it's not thinking that disruption is something called omnichannel or just one channel. It's all about channeling the customer. It's about people first. People first. It's not that people count. It's about people first. It's not mobile first. It's not Wi-Fi first. It's not cloud first, wearable first, or whatever comes next. It's strictly about people first. Because if you go people first, you will find digital because we're all using digital. If you go digital first, though, you're not really marketing. So I always ask the question of my clients, are you marketing or are you digitaling? Because if you tell me to be digital first, you're not marketing. If you tell me to market, you're definitely going digital. And there's a huge, huge difference. So the way I look at it, and this is the takeaway of my first one, disruptors talk to themselves. They talk to the market. It's great for investment. It's great for all you guys from Wall Street. You make a lot of money from it. But the truth is dissidents talk to the market. If you're dissident, you go further. So let me shatter convention number two, demographics. So here's the thing. This is 8th century BC. I see no hope for the future of our people if they are dependent on frivolous youth of today. For certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. So every single generation, I imagine from Adam and Eve, somebody has said this. Like I can see God saying it about Adam and Eve. You know, he looked down and he said that Apple thing, right? So he, read about Tom Wolfe writing about the generation of the 60s. He basically said the same thing. It's amazing. So we look back, we sit here and we talk about millennials like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Every generation in the world says, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, of the generation coming behind them. So we did a study, we did a survey. And our study, via our BAV study, it's not really a survey, it's a BAV study. I don't have time to go into all the details of it, but you can look it up at yr.com. It's BAV, Brand Asset Evaluator. It's the largest brand study in the world. It has many, as many aspects to it, and I'll talk about one of them in a minute. But we did it, we called it Generation World. It was our thesis, and we proved it out. So we looked at developing countries, developed countries, and semi-developed. So we looked at US, Brazil, and China. Amazing what we found. And I think the, the, the key findings, first, 55% of the world is ageless. People no longer define themselves by age. They couldn't care less. It's about values. So the truth is, I might have more values with somebody sitting in Sri Lanka than I do with somebody sitting at the desk next to me. So it's got nothing at all to do with age. 51% is self-directed. Self-direction is not just for young people. It's not just for millennials. We all are. 60% are mobile, but they don't look at mobile as, oh yeah, look, I got a phone. It's people should be free to live, work, and marry, however we want. It's about more about people being free and people having the opportunity to do what they want. And 60% feel empowered, personally empowered, to get what they want from life. So we look at this and we say it's amazing because if you, if you just lock yourself into traditional demographics, you get no place. So I live in a world where I hear all day long, millennials, 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 but the truth is they're not the only demographic. And marketers are waking up to this. Companies are waking up. This is a fast company. Whatever demographers may say, the millennial moniker has worn out its usefulness. And more and more companies are beginning to see this. And if you just watch marketing, if you just watch what's going on around you, you'll see that this is in fact true. And the most interesting thing is that boomers have way more money than anybody else. So when you look at 80 million of the American population, they are the largest living demographic. They're not old, they got a lot of money, and they don't have as much debt as the younger group. So in fact, this is a very important demographic. It doesn't mean that you don't market to millennials. It doesn't mean you don't market to Z's, but it means you don't leave them out either. So we gotta stop talking as if there is no other demographic then the millennials, and again, traditional demographic labels are irrelevant, I think it's important. So now let's talk about experiences. Experiences are great because they've never existed before in the history of the world. I sit in meetings and people come in and they tell me about, oh yeah, we're gonna create this great experience. It's all about experiential marketing. 
I mean, I kind of thought that's what I've been doing most of my life. And so, of course, if you look at Woodstock and look at Coachella, I love this picture. <laughs> there you are. It's the same people just, you know, 50, 60 years later. But experiences have always been with us. They'll be with us as long as there are people. And what's really interesting is that in a world where we like to pretend that brands aren't necessarily important to young people, which is, a, which is absolute nonsense, brands continue to enhance experiences. So Coachella is a sponsored thing. So think about it. Back in the day, Woodstock was not sponsored, right? Because, you know, marijuana wasn't legal yet. It might have been sponsored today. But Coachella is sponsored by some of the biggest sponsors in the world. And one of the great ones, H&M, I mean, they were all over it, but Urban Outfitters get sued because they tried to guerrilla it and it went no place. So my view is experiences, experiences, experiences. So Drake can sit next to Ben Stiller at a game and everybody is pretty happy. And if you've, been to, if you've been to a ball game lately, if you've been to a concert lately, it's amazing to see all the different ages that go. And I can only tell you my personal experience, I take my two grandsons, 11 and 8, we go see all the Star Wars movies together. And they love them every much as bit, and they love it every bit as much as I do. So there you go. Let's talk about purpose. Purpose is really important because as we know, purpose is driving the economy, right? And how do we know that? Because Lawrence Fink told us that. And he said, to prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes a positive contribution to society. Now, I assume he really believes this, and we'll kind of take it down in a second. So here are corporate statements of purpose, right? Here are all these companies showing you how important purpose is to them. The one I like best is JetBlue to inspire humanity, both in the air and on the ground. I don't know if you've flown JetBlue lately. <laughs> I, I mean, like, I like JetBlue. It's fun. I don't think that I was inspired, like, humanly by when I got on the plane. It was great, like, good leg room. The potato chips were cool. But all of these people, all these people are leaning into purpose because they think that it's important. But here's the thing. So Indra says they keep telling me why you Mother Teresa. So every time she tries to do what Lauren Sphinx says, she gets nailed. Paul Pullman, who I love, who's amazing, and he's not my client, neither is she, so I feel very comfortable talking about them. Paul, I think, is one of the most purposeful CEOs in the world. Unilever does some amazing things because they're real, and yet the activists and investors come after him. So I don't get it. BlackRock says, yes, you must be purposeful and save the world. Here's a guy who's doing it and actually delivering value, and he still gets nailed by the activist investors who say, no, you're spending too much money. Help me here, please, somebody. So I look at it and I say, okay, let's look at purpose. If purpose is so important, how did this happen? So in the quarter that United Airlines drags people off the plane bloody, they had their best quarter ever. <laughs> so where is the purpose? So bottom line, trust with purpose can drive value, but it has to be more compelling than convenience and price. So you have to have either you really are purposeful or you're not. And so United Airlines really doesn't care much about purpose, doesn't seem to, but it's okay. Convenience and price trumps it. It's good. It works for them. Paul Pullman, who actually tries to have it, gets nailed by activist investors. So purpose is important. I do believe in it. I spent the morning working with a client on it, on their purpose, but we try to make it real. Not authentic, by the way. I just wrote my, my, my weekly blog on this. was Authenticity to me is not real. There's reality and there's authenticity. Authenticity is a shadow of reality. And I think that's part of the problem. We, we chase authenticity, and we've kind of lost our view of reality. So a couple of final thoughts, and we still have time for some questions. So this is really important. Um, part of our BAV study, we have a study called Best Countries. It is a study that we do together with Wharton, sorry, Columbia. And we do it with the Wharton School of Business, uh, Professor Ribstein and U.S. News and World Report. It's, our, it's a, a partnership that we've had with them for three years. We launched this in Davos. Um, we launched it again this year. We did this year's launch in Davos as well. And it's an incredible study about which, what, what drives best countries, what drives the perception of why a country is powerful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we added some important things this year. So this was one of them. And what we see is that people perceive a leadership crisis in the world. 
right? So people believe it. They see it. And in that leadership crisis, it's pretty, it's pretty powerful when you think about it. 82% of the world says yes, they perceive a leadership crisis. And, excuse me, BDM is business decision makers, CLs are citizen leaders, and millennials. And you can see how it splits. What's most fascinating is that the U.S. has the highest percentage of people who perceive a leadership crisis in the world. Now, I can also tell you that, well, you'll see in a minute, I won't give it away, but 88%, that is high, and 88% of business decision makers, and you'll see why this is important in a second. And because of that, they trust private companies more than government to take care of their needs. Think about that. So companies are trusted more than our government leaders. And again, when you look at the world, it's 61%. You look at the US, it's 70%. So 70% of us trust our corporate leaders more than we trust government to solve some of the problems and to take care of our needs. And so the question is, who's leading our business? Right? So this is Mark. We're going through a broader philosophical shift in how we approach our responsibility as a company. We need to take a more proactive role and a broader view of our responsibility. And he has a tie that doesn't quite work. Um, <laughs> and got nailed in Congress when one, of the, in, 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 in one of the most embarrassing performances of all time, both from our own elected leaders and I would think also from him, but I think to me the telling moment was when one of, the, one of the senators asked him if he would tell them what hotel he had stayed at, and he said, and he fell right into the trap. He said, like, no. He said, that's the point, isn't it? And so here's the problem. So here's a, here's a leader who we sort of trust, and yet we're not trusting his company right now. Their trust is down to no place, frankly. And so how do we look at global leaders global business, this is how Americans perceive them. And I think it's really interesting because if you look, we tend not to trust as much the big business guys. We trust way more the entrepreneurs, disruptors, if you will. That's who we seem to trust more. So we trust the Jeffs and the, the Musks and the Bransons and the Cooks and Michael Dell, one of my clients. And Archimedes. These are the people we seem to trust more. And I think there's something telling about this. We like them more. We think there's more to them. They have more depth because they solve problems. They seem to solve problems. And that's what people want. So one last thing, and I think we still have time for a few questions. Digital is everything. This is what I want to leave you with. But not everything is digital. And I think this is sort of the summation of everything that I've said. And this is my most important point. So that is a picture of me in the most VR experience you could ever imagine, right? Everybody know VR, right? Virtual reality, except this is very real. I jumped out of an airplane at 10,000 feet. It was the most incredible thing I've ever done. Now, I could have done it in VR, like virtual reality. It would not have been the same thing. And it doesn't mean that VR is not great. I, I know more about VR. I, I work in VR. I love it. But, like, you can't compare it. It's different. So I look at it and I say, okay, digital is great, it's amazing, but sales of print books rose and sales of ebooks have dropped. It doesn't mean one is bad and the other is good. It just means we've reached this leveling point. Children's books. How many of you buy books for kids? Okay, if I'd asked that question, most of you, if I'd asked that question three years ago, everybody would have been embarrassed to put their hand up. But today we're not because it's amazing. Angry Birds. So everybody thinks the game, I play the game, I'm addicted to it. But the truth is that they lost money until they made themselves a real company, became 3D and started doing movies and merchandise and stuff. That's what, make them, that's what makes them money. Music industry, we know, and of course, the watch industry. So with that, I stop and like, I want to hear what you have to think. Mitch. Thank you. Th thank you, thank you, David. We we're, we're, we got a couple of questions, but we only have we only have time for one or two. So let's start with one question: Was in this world, how do you build brand value 
all these things going on, everything's changing. What's what's the path in the, in, with, with all with all this change to building long-term brand value? So the only way to build long-term brand value is to have a brand that is differentiated and relevant. So it has to be differentiated, it has to be different than other brands, and it has to be relevant to the people that buy it. Now to do that, you have to have a good product. So there's nothing today worse than, in fact, there's never been anything worse than having, you know, we always said the, the quickest way to kill a product is to have a bad product and have good advertising. Like nothing kills it faster, and it's even more true today. But if you can differentiate yourself and with that differentiation, make it relevant to the people who want to buy it, you can sell anything. Okay, one, one other question then. Hopefully David will have a few minutes to stay, stick around during the break so everyone can attack him with their questions. But um, one, one question that came from someone that clearly wasn't a millennial was millennials focus on reality and authenticity, but then they spend all their time on Instagram, which is, complete, which is basically creating this false reality. What's going on? How do you interpret that? So I think that actually is one of the biggest problems. So I wrote about it this week. So here's the generation that supposedly knows more about authenticity than anybody else, and yet is falling into the trap of false news or fake news almost as much or more maybe than anyone else. So I think it's a problem. I think that, I think that, that there is a perceptual issue here of thinking somehow that that is a real world, and it's not. And I think we're seeing now that with the usage dropping, so people want less friends. I think the most interesting thing is that people of my generation, so there's a guy, um, Robert Skubel, who's one of the original writers in, in high tech. So Robert believed when Facebook came out that you needed a million friends. And he went on this tear, he was gonna be the first person to have a million friends, and I think he actually got there. Because that's what everybody thought. We used to judge your popularity or your success in Facebook by the number of friends you have. We no longer do that. I'm in glad. fact, Kids don't get, kids don't want to have a lot of friends. They want to have less. Well, they're, they're not on Facebook anymore. I hate oh, to break that's it to another, you. Which, of course, is another issue. But I think, I think it's a problem of, it's, again, it's a problem of the digital world because people are, and it's not, just, it's not just millennials, by the way. It's people of all generation. They get caught up in it. But I think the good news is, I think really truthfully, we've reached this leveling place where we're starting to realize that the two worlds come together, the real world and the digital world, technology and people, and if we just stay focused on people, I think we'll be fine. So just want to remind you, when I introduced David, I said, we're introducing a contrarian. He disagreed with that, surprisingly. <laughs> um, then he told us disruptors talk to the market, but it's really dissidents. Disruptors talk to themselves, dissidents talk to the market. He told us traditional demographic labels, they're not really right either. He said experience, well, it's, it's just experience. He said, you know, he said purpose, BlackRock says it, but the investors don't agree, and they, they punish it. And then, you know, we trust, we, 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 you know, we, we trust small, we, we trust small, not large. So you guys can decide whether or not he's a contrarian. Anyway, David, thank you so much. This was great.